do you want to learn how to mix flash with ambient light? In this course, we scrap all the unnecessary, overwhelming information that you see online today. Here's what you actually need to start mixing flash with ambient light. My name is David Bishu. I am the light shaping expert at Prophoto Academy. In this course, you will learn the three-step process of exposure, how to add flash to improve existing light conditions, how to create motivated light. The three-step process breaks down how you easily set the camera for perfect exposure in difficult conditions when mixing flash with ambient light. Adding flash to improve existing conditions. How can you enhance existing conditions with flash with a natural feel? Creating motivated lights. How you can use the background to light your picture in a natural way. So join me in this course and I will show you how to get started today, no matter what the equipment you are using. Hello and welcome to Academy Live episode 29. 20. Nine. Hello ah, and welcome. Awesome. Andres Hamla here and of course... David Bishop here and of course the coffee and the computers and the beautiful sound machine and our beautiful voices. And faces. Don't forget the beautiful faces. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't, didn't know those. <laughs> Uh, welcome. Today, in today's episode, we are uh, going to, of course, uh, open up for questions. Let's pop over to the uh, So please do ask high, low, uh, left, right, whatever questions you might have. And uh, As long as it's about lighting, that is preferable. Then we can answer. I mean, you can ask anything, but we can answer about stuff like uh, uh, how to bake cookies. No, we cannot. No. no. We I can't cannot. at least. No. I'm really bad. Yes. And we got some friends here. First one to comment is, of course, Joel in Houston. Welcome. Uh, we got Hansta, France. We got Bangalore as well. And we have some more Swedes. Eric and Bus is here. Hello, Busa. And yeah, a lot of milk in the coffee. And Spain is here as well. And number 29. Uh, John, of course, from Seattle. Welcome. Yes. And we got Netherlands here as well. Good representation of the world, I would say. Yes. Uh, so we are happy. It would be actually quite cool to have one single person doing only that, putting up ne uh, needles on a, on a big uh, world map, map oh. just to see where people are. Oh, that's, that's true. That's, yeah. uh, I think that's actually even a function that you can see in, mm. uh, in Facebook afterwards. Afterwards. I'll need to go and talk to Malin, who is the social media yeah, manager. That would be so cool to see where yeah, people are where people at. Are. Anywho, uh, in today's episode we are going to talk about one part that is from the uh, uh, Fundamentals of Lighting course. Yes, the first course of the Fundamentals of Lighting mm -hmm. uh, and the title is How to Mix Flash with Ambient Light. Of that course, yeah. And yes. in, in there you are talking about uh, one thing which I, I use a lot. After mm. which I've learned from, from you, is the, the three-step process. Yes, the three-step process. I have broken down uh, how how you should do when you are when you want to light when you want to mix flash with ambient light. Yeah. And this is done in a three-step process. And it's really simple. And for all you guys who really are into flash uh, and ambient lights, uh, you actually do this already. Uh, but for people who are just starting out, this is a really good thing to. To, to learn three simple steps. Yeah, and that's kind of also part of the title is that uh, an easy and a fast way to get started with Flash because that is really the yeah. e easiest way to get started. And we already have Nina here is already uh, reporting to do the the, uh, the the map thing to put the needles on the map. Yeah, so cool. we already have one doing that. That's Nina, great. Uh, <laughs> but I think Nina is actually in China right now, so Ooh, maybe we can have a 
stream from China over here on a screen or something ah. where Nina is putting on the, the needles on the map, perhaps. Yeah, that's possible, that's possible. Yeah. Uh, but um, you've been gone for a couple of weeks. I have been for like two weeks. Yeah. Yes, I have been, been? Um, working a lot. Yeah. You can see, hear my voice, it's like <coughs> all tired. <laughs> um, I have been working a lot. I've been out at uh, the, the Nordic uh, f School of Photography uh, for like one week mm -hmm. teaching the new up-and-coming photographers out there about light. Did they teach you anything? Uh, they actually taught me something really, really nice. It was about uh, how to explain the depth of light. Ooh. Yes. Nice. You know, my, my, you, I used to explain it with, uh, spaghetti. with spaghettis. Yeah. And I got a new explanation, a new, a new way of seeing it. Really interesting. Maybe I shall tell you later. That sounds almost like an, uh, an episode where we try different yeah. Depth of lights, and maybe we should. Yeah, let's say uh, that. Because sometimes you have the challenge that you want to have like a really long depth of light, and yeah. uh, there are certain ways you can get that. Yes, even in limited spaces. Exactly, and there are sometimes when you want a really short depth of light. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Exactly. So oh. let's take that for a separate episode. That sounds like a good episode. Yes. But anyway, yeah. here the, the three-step process. That is. Uh, it's good sometimes, uh, and sometimes it's less good, uh, or less good. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's never wrong. No, it's never wrong. But, but for sometimes example, if you are in a studio environment and you want a pitch black environment, like in your studio, yeah, totally you control. Exactly. When you want a totally controlled uh, environment, where only, when you only want to have the light from your flashes, you do not want to have the ambient light yeah. at all. I mean, then the three-step process is like. This only way to do it. One way to do it: to just raise your shutter speed and get the totally black. Uh, ambient light, yeah. so you only have the flashes. But otherwise, like when you're on a maybe shooting on a wedding or mm -hmm. an event or in complicated lighting uh, situations, when you want to use flash and and when you do not want the flash to take over, when you want it to feel more natural. Yeah, exactly. So that's yeah. kind of a, one of the key points is that when you want the uh, the images to look like they're naturally lit, then yeah. this is a really good way to do it. Yes. Yeah. And, and Richard in, in Holland comes with a good idea on the on the world map. Yeah. Instead of using needles, let's put small flashing lights. Oh. Of course, of we course. need the flashes. <laughs> That's so crazy. And of course, we have uh, Poland here as well. Uh, so, in in as part of this uh, uh, this this process of, of mixing light, there's, there's there are a lot of other things that we also how you light and how you and, you know work with motivated light and so forth. We don't, we're not going to cover all that, but for those. Um, uh, if you don't, uh, nothing to see here. Uh, is there no voice? Uh, looks like Steven has problems with seeing or hearing. So if anyone else has problem in, in, in sound or images, then... Uh, uh, Let us know down in the comments. This yeah. is my voice. Yeah, and this is my voice. Do you hear us? Um, Steven seems like he doesn't. Yeah, okay, anyway, we'll continue until we hear uh, or see some more comments. Yes. Um, uh, we are gonna shoot some, uh, so we're gonna test this out. Yeah, uh, let's switch over to the big camera so you can see the setup. Yes, we are over here in the corner. And this is actually the worst image ever for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hello and welcome to this, <laughs> exactly. this episode. So let's go back to a better image, yeah. here we are. So we have set up uh, an environment. We, we have uh, we have camera. We have, of course, Ken. Uh, okay, Scotland can hear you fine, and Nina in China can hear us uh, fine. Perfect. Joel confirms as well. Awesome. Um, so we're going to use uh, uh, kind of simulate in, in, in uh, a, a shooting of a portrait, and uh, we want to mix the light with. Uh, the light that we have in here. Uh, in our studio here, we have uh, tungsten lights. So we have a very, very warm light. And this is the light you see here. It's uh, actually very warm. Yeah. So and actually, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't look warm here because no. we have set the, the, the white, white balance, balance to, to, mix, uh, to make this look neutral. Yeah. But the warm, it's like, I think it's like about 3,200 Kelvin yeah. or so. Somewhere there. Yeah. Uh, but we have actually manipulated one corner. We put some daylight in there. Yes. Uh, and that's going to be our background. So we have a, a daylight lit background and we have a Ken head and we also have a whole bunch of stands and modifiers, etc. in the background just to make it look busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we managed pretty well on making it look like a junkyard maybe and not 
But that's, yeah, well, that, w- that, but that was the vision we had. Like the point here is to show how the three-step process works. Yeah. And we will do that with this beautiful setup. Excellent. That is the important Thank part. Thank you, everybody, Nigel and, and Ula, uh, for confirming with the sound and picture. Yes. Perfect. So, so I suggest that we actually are going to uh, take a walk over uh, and uh, take a look at the... Uh, I want to say, here we, we, Richard has a long, long one. Can you tell me a little bit more about the continuous light on the B10? Where does it start in Kelvin? And by which Kelvin does it stop? Uh, totally the left starts tungsten, but after how many clicks starts fluorescent, daylight and cloudy, etc. Uh, maybe it's possible with the software update that we come with tungsten zone, for instance. Zone. Well, so so. On that note, so the question is basically, uh, the B10 you, uh, has a very nice uh, fixed light, and you can uh, increase and decrease the strength. So of course, that's nothing strange. But you can also change the temperature. And, and Which is really, really, really cool. It is really, really cool. Yeah. Useful. Yeah, very useful. And, uh, but there's one thing, and, and, there is, and what, what Richard is asking for here is, is there is no numbers like, 3,200 Kelvin, so you can't see exactly what Kelvin you are at. Uh, or even a tungsten or so forth, like you have on the camera, uh, you have a tungsten light bulb. And yeah, uh, symbols for a certain Kelvins yeah. to make the Kelvin uh, And the reason, reason for that is that uh, today LEDs are not, uh, the manufacturing process of LEDs is not stable enough to, that you can have uh, a lot of LEDs exactly with the same range. So even if I give, and because you control the temperatures of by how much current you put in and so forth, and uh, um, I suppose it, it's like, and if you enter, if you give them exactly the same conditions, the so two different LEDs, same amount of current and uh, voltage and, and all everything exactly the same, you end up in di- in small differences, and and that's just because that's the way, uh, how far the, the LED manufacturing process has gone today. So it's, and, it's and not yeah. stable enough. And, and so if, if we would put a number that, oh, this represents 3,200 kel- uh, Kelvin or a light bulb, it will be different. So if you have two lights and you set them at the same setting, uh, which they people will, di- will do. They will differ. Yes, yes so there will, there will be a difference between them. And that's why your eyes are actually the best judges. And so you look at, first of all, the ambient light, and you, you, you move the, the setting until you see, okay, now it looks like it, it's matching, it's the same, because then it is the same. Because and the same if you have two flashes lighting from left and right, and, and, and then you just light them, and then you twist them both until they, till they, until they match, because then they match. Uh, and if we would have a, a fixed position, and if you put both of them at the same position, there might be a slight difference, and then you, uh, that would be visible on the yes. image you take. And I suppose this is also, maybe you should, I mean, <coughs> it's all about price range. I mean, if the B10 would cost 10 times more, then I suppose you could do a lot of stuff in there, you know, to get, uh, to, to calculate, yeah, or so, I don't know. Of, of course, yeah, there is a, there is a balance between uh, to make the, the B10 where it is at the market. Exactly, yeah. So you could, of course, put in sensors that would read the lights and so forth and, and, and change them. Um, and, and so, uh, if, if, I mean, we could put a, t- a, a Kelvin number, or we could put a, 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 a light bulb in there. But when you actually measure the light and really look into it, there will be a difference. Uh, and even if, I know there are other brands that are using uh, Kelvin numbers and they are using uh, uh, symbols and so forth. But if you take two of those, which we have tried with, with other, other competitive brands, there is a difference. But you have the same number, but there's still a difference. If you measure them with the light meter, there's a difference in, in, in temperature. Uh, so it doesn't really help you uh, as, a, as a photographer. Well, I think the key thing here is, I, I do understand the, the you want to read what you are doing. Like yeah. it's in, uh, interesting to have numbers too, so you can rely on. But the key thing here, for me at least, <coughs> is that the important part, it is, isn't the number, because the, the number itself, if it, if it isn't exactly exact, yeah. 
Yeah. Then you are out and taking a ride. So you still need to believe your your eyes. eyes. That at is at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. You you can. It's like when you have a you know a tripod with a with a leveler mm. on. Yeah. And if the 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 bubble is yeah. in the center, it this is straight. But if the walls in the room are like this, your image still will be crooked. Yeah. yeah. So you you still need to believe what you are seeing, and your gut feeling is your the best judge, and it's really important. Uh, but I do understand his his um, uh, concern. Yeah. You want. It's nice to have numbers. You have numbers in the camera, and you have numbers everywhere. Exactly. Uh, but I, I would, for me, I would say that the B10, the temperature there is for. It's, it's not like a measurement tool. It's not like a. Uh, it's for, if I'm going to light you, I look at you and I tweak the color so it matches the temperature here because, the temperature in here mm. will be different. So, uh, when. Um, like if you go into another room, you will have another temperature yeah. and you cannot read it and, and try to match it with numbers. That is not the correct way to do it, I would say, when you're using the B10. Yeah. That is not that kind of product. The, um, so, yeah. yeah. So, the, the numbers for me, I do not miss them well, when yeah. I use the B10. Yeah, no, I mean, me neither. But, but, but I know there are some that do, and, but they, 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 they will not be there because as soon as you put the number on there, and if they are not exactly, then people will complain, well, I put these both lights on uh, the same number, but still there's a difference. And that's just because that's the way LEDs work. If it would be in halogen or any other, like a, a real a, a tungsten light as a modeling light, then you can, because then you can control it and, and they are more ac accurate. Hmm. That's kind of the, the, uh, the downside with uh, LED technology. The good thing with it is that it doesn't get warm, and uh, it doesn't cost uh, as much as uh, uh, halogen and so forth. So it's a pretty uh, price efficient uh, way of lighting, even though you'd miss some part of the spectrums and so forth. But mm. uh, 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 so that's kind of what it is. Uh, of course, there are uh, uh, high end solutions. And if you buy a batch of LEDs and if they are coming from the same, like in the same order, they are fairly similar but as soon as you're starting to make huge numbers like with like the b10s and if you buy a b10 at one store and uh, and then maybe wait a week and then you buy another one or uh, you buy maybe an, in a different store yeah. they will be different they will not be from the same batch yeah i, I know that ari for example i saw this comment about how do ari does it i know that they buy uh, leds and they measure them and every lead that is exactly the same, they save them and, and, and throw the rest away. Yeah. Which makes the Ari lights really expensive. Mm. And I mean, if you would do that with the B10s, you won't be able to buy the B10 because it's will be, it, it will, will be, be too, too expensive. expensive. Yeah. So um, uh, it's all I, I, a question I, about price. Yeah. And, 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 but the, in range wise, they are from somewhere around 3,200 up to 6,300, that's the span where, where the B10 is working, plus minus. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the span. So it, it starts in the, in the very beginning of the scale, it's around uh, light bulb, tungsten type of light. And then it goes all the way to uh, uh, above and beyond regular uh, sunlight, for example. So just, just before uh, the very end, you are at uh, around 5,900, 5,500, uh, and in the, that span, that's where the sun is, depending on at what time, of course, mm. of day, because even sunlight is different. Yeah, this uh, one question here, uh, Landon says, the B10 is already too expensive. Well, if you look at a early LED light, the only LED, no flash, it's more expensive, so... Yeah. Yeah, uh, and it was this thing I thought about here, let's see, um, uh, Richard said, it is not exactly about the numbers, more where does sunlight starts, for an instance. Yeah, and that's, that's towards the end of the uh, end of the scale. And then sunlight, what sun, I mean, sunlight is it from differs. very warm, yeah. from um, all the way to very, very cold, depends on where you are in the world and yeah. also what time of the day. Sunlight in a camera, it is actually, uh, on a hill somewhere in England, I think, at noon, at a special time of the year, that point, yeah. that is when the Kelvin are like 5,600. So it's like 
sunlight, the Kelvin of sun is changing a lot during the day, during the year, during your position on the earth, during the pollution in the air and yeah. so forth. So you have to use your eyes. Yeah. That is the absolutely most accurate way of doing it. Yeah, because the second you start relying on, on, on the numbers, yeah. you will have a, a, a mismatch. Uh, so, uh, any plans to add the LEDs to the B1X? Well, the B1X has LED uh, modeling light already, uh, but it does not have the ones where you can uh, change the temperature, because then you would have to you know, replace the existing LEDs on it, so, so I'd be very surprised if they do that, if they, if they send them in, because then they have to repair them, basically, or change them. Uh, so, uh, uh, what's the question here? Sometimes my video automatically changes power from line. Oh, there's a question about the air remotes. So we'll, we'll come back and we'll look at that, uh, Sebastian, and, and see uh, what, what could be causing that, because it sounds like it's... Because uh, if you have a remote that where you changes the powers from 2 to 10 and then back and forth, then something, something is wrong uh, with, with those, those uh, remotes, because I've never had that problem. Oh, I, I wasn't uh, following it. So yeah, so if you have, if you have a, a, a B1 and uh, use the remote, and then you, you're firing, and then it goes from 2 to 10, or you know, th the power level on the B1 mm -hmm. changes. Wow. I, I, I'm, I'm not run into that, but so I, I think it might be something is a glitch in the in the remote. Yeah, I never experienced that. I mean, there's so many, you always need to be able to, to reproduce mm. errors to know exactly the conditions so you so so it's possible to figure out to what can cause it. Yeah, but let's go and take yeah. a look at uh, how to fast and easy um, uh, get started with Flash, uh, and, and, and basically a, a three-step process on uh, how to work with your camera and start adding uh, Flash. Yes, and, and then we'll come back uh, and we'll look through uh, answers, so keep on typing them up, and we will uh, uh, look into questions, And because uh, I think this will be a fairly Fast exercise. Yeah, it seems like you guys are on fire with questions. We love that. <laughs> yes. So that's good, and uh, and that's why we're here to answer your questions. So so we'll do our our utmost to do that. Yes. Uh, but let's walk over. Let's walk over to the experimental area. Yes. And I'll grab the. And we'll show some pictures on capture one as well, so we can see that. So let's see. And there we go. I'm on the dongle. Cool. So I'm here. Yes. And there's the bright corner, by the way, where yeah. we, we have the daylight. The and beautiful. you can see how it feels very uh, cold, but it is actually sunlight balanced. So that's where you have 5,600 yeah. Kelvin-ish. I, I, I actually asked the developers of, uh, well, some developer guys from Canon and Nikon, and yep. they're, they're, they said that their sensors is uh, made for 5,600 Kelvin. So it's some kind of, you know, they make stuff after that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for you guys who really know about Flash, this will be like, really, you will be like, yeah, we know. And that's the way it should be, because I will not tell you anything magical. But for you guys who are just starting out with Flash, we need actually to cover the absolute basics this is really important. You have to know this simple thing. And you have probably seen this all around, this triangle, mm -hmm. the, tr uh, the triangle of exposure. And you have seen it because it's so, so fundamental and so true. You have three settings in your camera that makes your exposure, okay? You have the aperture, you have the shutter speed, and you have your ISO. And to be able to use flash to mix flash with ambient light you need to know what these things are doing if you don't then it will be tricky so this is the first the basic the foundations of how the camera works that you need to know so let's just take a quick run through uh, to look at what the aperture does what the shutter speed does when using flash and the iso yes okay so let's start with aperture 
the aperture, the deer aperture. It's a small hole in the back of the lens that you can make it bigger or smaller. That is the physical thing, that is the aperture. But what changes in the image? What is controlled when you are changing the aperture? Let's take a look at the camera to try it out, okay? So here we have the camera and we have Mr. Ken in front of the camera. And behind Ken, we have the background, right? So the aperture, with the aperture, you control how blurry the background should be. You want the background to be really sharp at the same time as Ken, or do you want the background to be really, really blurry at the same time as Ken? If you have it really blurry, that is very popular in, in portrait photography because then you are separating Ken from the background. It's really obvious what you want to put your focus on. Yeah. And if you have a really long depth of field, a sharp background, then Ken might, uh, it will be really busy. You know, he will have stands everywhere pop popping out of his head and such. And it's hard to read the image. But that could also be good if you want to make an image that is more uh, hard to read, so to speak. Or if you are if you are in Scotland and you have this beautiful uh, lighthouse. Yes, if you are in Scotland <laughs> and you want to have the sheep in the front sharp and the lighthouse in the back sharp. Yeah. Then you then you want to have a long depth of field, and that is the same as a high number of the aperture. Yes. Okay. A low number could be like two point eight or like one point two or something. That's a low number. A high number, in other words. Long depth of field could be like 11 or 22 or yeah. such, okay? So that is the first thing you need to know, the aperture, what it does. So let's take an example image. I, let's see, the camera is on. And we have Mr. Ken here. Let's see where we are at. Oh, he's so beautifully yellow, that's nice. Let's make him less yellow, like that. And okay, so this image now, here you can see that the background is really, I don't know if that's, view, uh, is po if it is possible to see, the background is really, really blurry. Yeah. That means that we have an aperture that makes the background blurry. And if we look at the number here, this is the aperture number, that is 5.6. Yeah. So if I press a, a, a button on the camera in the front here, you can't see it, then we can actually see the aperture effect. If I raise the aperture to 22, yeah. it's go it goes darker. Let's bring in some more light. The background becomes much more sharp. Yeah, so now you can actually see that there are light stands. And yeah, so if I go back to like 4.0, which is this camera's smallest aperture, yeah. Uh, or actually big, biggest aperture in when you sp talk about the, the physical thing, uh, the background becomes much more blurry, okay? Yeah. So the aperture number sets how blurry you want your background. Cool. So yeah. that's what aperture does. And yes. what's the next step and then is then the, the shutter speed, right? Okay, so now we know the aperture, yeah. blurriness, background. The shutter speed, what does the shutter speed do? The shutter speed is of course the speed of the shutter as the name uh, intense. Uh, if I change my shutter speed, we will let less light in and it will go darker, of course, darker or brighter. But when you are using flash, something quite interesting is, is, uh, is happening. Uh, let's say that I have a shutter speed of 160 yeah. here and I have a flash up there, a B10. Yeah. Uh, let's just take an image just to see what will happen. Let's see if the flash, oh, the flash needs to be on. I put the flash on, just like that. We have a shutter speed of 160 and as you can see the background is really dark. I take an image. And then we go to capture one. Capture one. Where do we have capture? I can do a capture one dance. There we go. <laughs> a very, very blue image. Yeah, very I blue think image. Your, your white balance is all over the map. Absolutely. Right now. 
But you, as you, okay, so yeah. this so is we what can we see. have. Yeah. So if I do, if I now change the, the, the shutter speed to a slower shutter speed, so more light comes in, mm -hmm. what will happen is so that... now you have the shutter speed of one, uh, one hundred and sixtieth of a second. Yes, one hundred and sixtieth of a second. So if I bring in more light by making the shutter speed slower, the background will become brighter, right? Yeah. As we can see, as we can see when I actually have need to turn this off to be able to see that. So the lower speed of the shutter speed, the brighter the whole image. And in our case, the background, that is the interesting part. Yeah. For so let's put it on one eighth of a second. Mm -hmm. So this brightness is caused by the one eighth of a second. And I put on the flash, mm -hmm. let's take an image, and go back to capture one. And I presume that we will have the same blue shit, oh, sorry, same blue <laughs> <laughs> color, uh, but the background is much brighter. Yeah. So compared to the last, to the previous image, you see the light on the face is the same, but the background is darker. And the key thing here is that it affects the background because the background is hit by the ambient light. So what happens if you set the white balance to uh, like a, a human white balance? Like a human white balance. Yeah. I, I so, so, so to kind of reflect, uh, put it at flash or the daylight so that it looks normalish. Yes. Let's so put it on. people don't think that that's... Uh, that's so true. I put it on 5600 just to match my previous yeah. sayings. So, and here we, here we clearly can see that we got a much warmer tone because mm -hmm. of the white balance. And we can also see that the person, the guy, the doll, is also kind of warm. And now if you put it to 1 60th of a second again. Exactly. So let's go, let's cut off the ambient light. And put it to 1 60th and let's go 3, 2, 1 and boom. Now we remove as much of the ambient light as we can here. Yeah. Then we only have the flash in a, in a neutral color. So the key thing here, the key thing is that the, the shadow speed controls the ambient light, not the flashlight. The flash light is the same power, but the shadow speed controls the ambient light. Okay, so, so step one is when you, when you uh, are going to start using flashes, the first step is that you, you decide how blurry you want the background. Yes, that is the first thing. How blurry do you want the background? In other words, which aperture do you want to use? Yeah. The second part is how bright do you want your background? That is the shadow speed. Yeah. So there's two steps here. Blurriness, aperture. Brightness, shadow speed. And then? And then. Then you look, actually maybe we should look at our Oh, the little diagram here. Yeah, the three-step process, because this is actually the, th the three-step process. So first, the first thing you do is you set your blurriness of the background. This, and this is done with the aperture. Yep. And then you control the brightness of the background with your shutter speed. Mm -hmm. And when you have these two numbers, if we look at this mm -hmm. triangle here again, when you have the aperture and you have your shutter speed, yep. If these two numbers is good, I mean, if you have uh, a too long of a shutter speed, then you might have a motion blur. And if you have too fast shutter speed, then you might end up with, with sync problems, like uh, no flash will go through, like it's over 160 for a pro photo flash and a Canon and so on. So if you have numbers that isn't okay, that isn't perfect shooting conditions, then you can adjust this by using the ISO. So then you can move the range. Exactly, you move the range down. up and down. So you have the same exposure, but with the ISO, you just move the range so you get numbers, uh, especially the, the, the shutter speed. It will be uh, a reasonable shutter speed. Because normally you, you, you mentioned that a shutter speed should normally be around your lens. Focal uh, length. Focal exactly. length. Exactly. So that if is you have an 85 millimeter lens. If you look at this lens here, so the question is, is uh, okay, so what is a reasonable uh, shutter speed? Yeah. So as Anders said, if you look at your lens, if it is now it is on 105 millimeter, yeah. if I zoom back, it's on 24. So that is the focal length. So your shutter speed can be, it's a good thing to start at, start at 
105, for example, of a second. If I'm at 24 millimeters, really wide angle, then you can use 1 24th of a second. As Without a getting speed. motion blur. Exactly, because yeah. then you will not have motion blur. But I have to add to that, that is the old way of saying it. Nowadays, the cameras are so high resolution, so I recommend that you double that. Yeah. Like if you are on 105 millimeters, then you should need 105 of a second, but double it. So uh, 210th of a second, for mm -hmm. example. Because then that's the, the, the least, smallest risk to get motion blur, because I mean, you're breathing, yeah. you're, you're moving, so there's, yeah. or the, mo the person, the person is, moving. is moving. Yeah. Exactly, or you might have earth shake, yeah. you're shaking differently. <laughs> yeah, like we were in Japan, there were earth, earth, yeah, earthquakes. Yeah, it was really scary. Uh, so the shutter speed, a, a perfect shooting conditions for the shutter speed, roughly around the length, the focal length of your lens. Yeah. Just an easy way to remember it. And if that turns out to be really, really slow, for example. Yeah. Because like I mean, we, we listen to cameras and we try to guess what's the shutter speed of the camera. Yeah, that's a really fun are. part of the trick. Really works nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for example, let me put this on a really slow shutter speed. Let's say, let's take a... Uh, yeah, but take, a take something that way you actually would take a picture, because you wouldn't take that picture, for example. Okay. Uh, so... Or, or even... Uh, or how do you mean, like... How would it look like in the one fiftieth of a second, even or one thirtieth of a second? This or is twentieth. Yeah, yeah, so that might be a picture that you actually would take with flash, right? Okay, with flash. You mean like if when? Yeah. So flash we, and then we, and we are trying to take a picture with flash, and we've, we we have we have set the background to a brightness level that we want. Uh, that looks bright enough for me. Uh, we have an aperture at 4.0, so it's kind of as blurry as it can be on this camera yeah, with that lens. Exactly. But we are down at one thirtieth of a second, so that is too slow. Exactly. And, and How when does you it have sound when we, when we take a picture yeah. here? So at a thirtieth of a second, it sounds like this. Okay, to so come. Yeah. Let's, let's take just one more, just to listen to it. Tuka. Did you hear the sound? Tuka. Yeah. And actually, that sound, tuka, it can sound like tuka. That's like a one second shutter speed. And if you mm. sound like tuka, then you have a really fast shutter speed. So you can hear the camera's shutter speed ish. Yeah, so now we are at, at 1 30th of a second. And if, if I say that, well, I want to have 125th of a second. Yeah, and why would you want to have 125th of a second? Just to be really push this in. Just, uh, that is because you you might have motion blur on 1 30th of a second. So let's go up to 1 125th of a second. And while I do that, I'm going to count the number of clicks. This is called the click trick. So if I take my mic, so you really can hear me counting from <laughs> 30 to 125. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six click. Okay. Okay, so we have made the shutter speed six clicks faster. But now it's darker. Yeah, and then it will become six clicks darker. So now we are using the ISO to raise everything up. Okay, and how much? Six clicks. So the same number here. So I just press my ISO button here and one, oh sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I have raised my ISO to ISO 400. And I am at 125th of a second, which is a good shutter speed, and at my aperture as I wanted it. So basically now you have a, the same exposure, the, the picture looks exactly the same, and, but you have a faster shutter speed which will decrease the amount of motion blur. Exactly. And that's the click. So basically you count the number of clicks up to a good shutter speed. So if in this case it was six, six clicks up to 125th uh, of a second. And then you do the same thing with ISOs, six clicks up on the ISO, and then you have the image look exactly the same, and uh, uh, you have a faster shutter speed. Exactly. So, uh, and when we have the faster shutter speed, you might think that, oh, well, then the background should be darker. But no, because you have raised everything with the ISO. Mm. So the ISO is there for you to help you to, to move around in the range of your exposure as you want. Yeah, so basically that 
sets the sensitivity of the sensor, how sensitive should the sensor be in taking in uh, light. So yeah. you move the range that you have decided up exactly. and down. And of course, when you raise the ISO, you get more noise, but mm -hmm. the cameras today is really good at removing noise or not getting any yeah. noise. So I would say like on this camera, Mark IV, Canon 5D Mark IV, you could be like on 100 and, uh, 1600 with no problems, no problems at, all. at all. So you have a lot of range there with ISO to save you to have your wanted aperture and your wanted shutter speed. Yeah. So that basically you, you, you set the background by deciding how blurry and how bright it should be. And when you're done with that and you have the good show shooting conditions, you say uh, first then you start exactly, lighting. Exactly. When you, I will just repeat that because it's so important. When you have done this background, when the background is set as you want it to look, then you fix the, the numbers for the, of the shutter speed and ISO to make it a perfect shooting conditions in camera. Mm -hmm. When that is and when then is that is done, then it's time to light your subject. Yeah. So then basically you have set your canvas and the camera is your canvas the sensor and, it, and the canvas for, uh, for the image and then you don't touch the camera anymore. No, you, you do not want to touch the camera to change the power of the flash yeah. because you change that on the flash to make it look as you want. And then now you have decided if you are, in, let's say you're in a party and there's a certain amount of light in there, you decided how blurry it's going to be and how bright it's going to be and now you can run around with your flash on TTL and take pictures and move back and forth and there is not going to be any problem. The background will always look the same. Yeah, and that is the key thing. Yeah, you and create then you the background, the you have the same background at all times exposure wise yeah. and let the TTL just do the work for the flash. And if the flash should of course do the lighting on your subject, not on the background. Yeah, no because then you ruin your whole creative thing and it will look flashy. If yeah. you keep the flash only on your subject, your background is perfect no, and natural, then it will look more natural than if you are flashing up everything. Cool. So it's basically that easy. Use your aperture to decide the blurriness, then you do, uh, use the shutter speed to decide how bright it should be. And most probably you have perfect shooting conditions. If you don't, then you use the click trick and that is using the ISO and count the number of clicks to get the shutter speed you need and do yeah. the same with the ISO, one, two, three, four, five. And then you light. And then you shoot. Yeah. And then you go home. <laughs> exactly, with great images. <laughs> yeah, so so let's that's look. really a simple way. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the final image there where we haven't actually done anything else than just took in the image here. Uh, so... Let's see where we are at. Here we are. There we are. Okay. So what do we have here? We have a slightly overexposed man, but that is not a problem because we could act always turn down the power of the flash, which we didn't. Yeah. But we have the background as we wanted it. The brightness of the background and the blurriness of the background and then put the flash on. And then, of course, the next step is to tweak the, fly, uh, the, the flash, the power of the flash, yeah. which we haven't done here. Cool, that's a, a good walkthrough of that. And let's see if I can find, here we are. Let's see if we have any questions. Uh, let's come back to them. Uh, what camera gear do they shoot with? Oh, we're shooting uh, with the uh, uh, Canon today. Uh, we're shooting all, all kinds of brands here. We got cameras. We have a, a, a nice little cupboard with the yeah. Sony's, Fuji's, Olympus, Face Ones, Nikon's, Canon's, yeah, and so forth. The so right camera for the right uh, purpose. And we, yeah, so we shift. And uh, so, anyway. Uh, uh, a question from, from, from our friend, Shintaru, uh, Thin Penumbra. I think, or yeah. yeah. Uh, when you use a slow shutter speed, Ken's face oh, it disappeared. Ken's face gets mixed with ambient light. Yeah, and that's true. Light. So we actually, we, since we still left the the ambient light on, you still had some of that warm light on on the image. We should have uh, dimmed those, and then it would be more controlled uh, environment. Yes, um, and I mean, if we are 
we are in the same power level here. The, the roof, the, the ambient light is quite strong uh, compared to the background. If our background was much, was much more stronger compared to the ambient light, then we wouldn't have the problem with the ambient light. Yeah. Uh, and what I used to do, I do like this, but I always try to make my subject as dark as possible. I place the subject where you don't have as much ambient light, so you don't have that problem with the mix of the color temperatures. And that can be done by just placing the person somewhere else, or by flagging, or by turning down the lights, as you, as you said. Yeah. So that is something that you have to consider, of course. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference in different flash modes, normal versus freeze? We got a question from Joel here. Uh, so, oh, there's actually, uh, most of uh, Profoto's flashes have normal mode and freeze mode. And, and actually the freeze mode is uh, a setting that you should use when you really want to freeze, freeze motion. Because what they do is that when, when you have a, a, a flash go off, they actually cut the flash. So they make it uh, as short as possible. And what happens to the color temperature when you sh when you cut off the flash? Oh, it gets bluer. Yes, you get a bluer, colder, colder yeah. color of the flash. And that isn't a problem because you can always change that with your camera uh, or with your uh, white balance. Yeah. Uh, but the, there might be a problem if you are using two flashes, like one on speed, on uh, what's the word? Speed, uh, freeze mode. One on freeze mode and another one not on freeze mode. Then you have two color temperatures. Then it might be a yeah. problem. So it's a special situation when you want to freeze action. Uh, exactly. So if, if, if something is moving, you want to freeze it, uh, use the freeze mode. Do not use HSS. No, HSS. That's the, that's the, the exact opposite of freeze mode because you make the flash longer since you have a, a longer pulsating flash. Uh, yeah. And there's a whole, whole episode on that uh, which you can find on the videos on Fa Profile Facebook. Yeah, uh, number 20 and, something. Yeah, exactly. And, and there we I, I go through exactly what happens and you can see the difference. I have a small fan that I'm, I'm freezing and what happens with HSS and what happens with um, uh, yeah. normal mode. So and, and I think that the confusion about HSS and freeze mode is the stupid name HSS, high, high speed, speed sync. Yeah. Everybody thinks it's about when you're going to Something is you're shooting something, something in high, high speed. speed, but it's actually the shutter going yeah. in high speed. Yeah, exactly. So high speed sync has nothing to do with freezing stuff. Yeah. So, so the best way to do it is either use regular normal mode. Normal is better than HSS, uh, but freeze mode is really the fastest because that's when you use uh, technology to cut the flash and you get the sh as short as possible uh, burn time. And also key when you are freezing is try to get the ambient light down as much as possible. So the more ambient light you can eliminate, uh, the better it will be to freeze the motion because if you have a lot of ambient light and it's impacting the image, the, the camera sensor is recording that light and it's actually lighting the thing that's moving. Yeah. That can also be used as an effect if you want to have the nice blurry stuff yeah. in, in the image. In front or behind, yeah. depending on first or second curtain, and so on. Yes. And where are we? Oh, Pascal, you need to watch it, this episode from the beginning. Uh, you missed out on the uh, Kelvin uh, questions. Or give me a call and I'll explain to you. Uh, uh, Pascal is our... Uh, is a photographer in Belgium who's so doing a lot of trainings uh, for Profoto on the products. Uh, actually, you should know this. I'm surprised. We'll have to uh, make sure that we get you the information uh, down there. We have a comment here from Jim Gormley. He says, yes. when, I, <coughs> when I've got my background as I like, I'd get my light meter out and set the flash to match the camera settings. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. if you if you have your light meter and if you have the time to do it, then that's a really great way to do. But I would say that this way of doing it, this is more for a much more hectical situations, like on a wedding or like on an event or when you're running around and running about. Yeah. So and then you're using the light meter in the camera and the TTL function exactly. to, to set the light. So this so is a really, I mean, for TTL. Yeah, it's an uh, easier way. Yeah. But uh, so for example, if you're shooting a party, and you're taking 
all the party event uh, imagery, then it's hard to run with a light meter. But if you are, for example, in on, on a, a certain location, you have a controlled environment, the pulse is below 60 and everything is cool, yeah. then light meters, of course, is a, a very fast way. And, and I would say like this, uh, this trick, or not trick, but this method, this three-step process, it's when you're using live view on your camera, that is the, the, the whole point of it. I maybe, maybe we didn't say that. You have live view on your camera and you create your background with a shutter speed yeah. and aperture so you see something that you like. And that is what you are using for background when you are lighting. If you're using a light meter, then you are having a number that tells the camera that this will be as safe as possible. It has nothing to do with what you like. And with the live view, you can actually create what you want. That yeah. is a creative thing that I think that you shouldn't forget. Because with the camera, you can create your images, not just taking them. Yeah. Uh, Chris Law was, uh, what about shooting outdoors in bright sunlight? Yes, yeah, so uh, if you're outdoors in bright sunlight, uh, then of course uh, you can still do the same thing here. And it, it most probably what will happen is that your shutter speed will go above the sync speed. So maybe to 1000 or 1 800th of a second, which is above the flash sync time of your camera. Uh, and that's when the flash will kick into HSS, so high speed sync. So that's really where, where it, it, it helps out a lot. Yeah. So when the shutter speed is really fast, then it's when HSS yeah. is kicking in. And Joel asks, so I do shoot under my sync speed and go to freeze mode. Exactly. So that's what you do. You, you try to stay at your, at your uh, sync speed or below, and then you use freeze mode. That's absolutely the best uh, way to freeze action. Uh, and the only way you can get under the sync speed is basically to kill out the ambient light as much as possible. And if you are trying to freeze motion um, out in the sunlight, it's, it's going to be hard to, to uh, uh, use the extreme uh, speeds like a 150,000 of a second or 120,000 of a second or like in the Pro Tense example, 180,000 of a second. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way you can do that is by adding a lot, lot of flashes. So you put them on the low power and then you add several of them. Maybe, you know, six Pro Tens. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, that is fun. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've done that. Uh, and, uh, and then you get still short flash durations and still a lot of light because each, each light adds up. Yeah, one uh, step. One step, yeah. Uh, we, we got this uh, from Shintaro. <coughs> he says, if it is hard to cut ambient light, then color gel. And I would like to say like this, if you have a different color of your flash and your ambient light, then you will have a problem from the start. It will yeah. always look like it's a flash or it's too bright or too, too warm in the background, for example. Then you should need a f uh, you should have a color gel on the flash from the beginning. Yeah, if like an have. orange colored. Exactly. Uh, you, so there is for like uh, the, the OCF uh, color gel kit, I think, th that you can uh, put on the B10 and all the flashes. Yeah. Really nifty, just like pop them on to get the same color of your flash as your ambient lights. Yeah. Yeah. And Joel, yes, he's trying to cut the, the, the end tail of the flash. Yeah, so then it's freeze mode. And um, then we are good, good, good to go on that one. Outside portrait shooting on a cloudy day. Whoops. I clicked over. Main light source is a cloudy sky. It makes a very soft light, invisible, wide penumbra. Uh, and it tends to be a boring picture. What's your idea to make a picture more interesting? So, yeah, that's a good, good question. Yeah. Um, well, uh, for so we have this uh, just so that everybody who maybe not reading the comments. So, so we have a, a sky, a cloudy yeah. sky, uh, gray. So like a basic regular Swedish day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a big so, uh, cloudy sky. That yeah. is the big uh, a big light source which create really wide penumbras, yeah. really flat and boring light. Yeah. But what to uh, do? Yeah, what to do? I mean, one thing is you can uh, just take a light with, with like, a, like a, this northern light and uh, um, instead of a sunlight. So you get this really flat light, which is very popular among some sculptures and, and artists. They like to have their windows towards the, uh, north. the northern north. So they get that type of light. Yeah, but I think that the, yeah. his comment was like, 
if it is too boring, it's too mm. flat, what to do? And I would say there's two sides of the, that coin. You could, uh, one thing is you cut off light. If you have like black flag, if you have a black flag or something dark, a, a wall or anything that creates darkness. So you extend, you, you em, em, emphasize, how do you say that? You, you make, emphasize, yeah. emphasize the, the shape, the three dimensional shape by putting a shadow one side or perhaps a two sides. So you can see what goes into the image and out from the image. So the sphere of a face, for example, will be more sphere, spherish. <laughs> then it will actually look more three dimensional and that removes that flat, boring feeling. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you can do, if you are in that situation that you can't flag out light to create more depth, then you put flash on it too. Just a tad, just to emph emphasize even more the shape of the face. Yeah. Put, it, put a direction on it, put some kind of, uh, um, uh, em emphasize the direction of the light. If you have everything in the background that you can see that, that the light is maybe coming from the left to the right or such, do the same thing on the face with your flash. Then you will uh, connect the face with the background and, and it will feel more, more natural. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, make the shadows even darker by cutting out light. Yeah. And actually you can put everything in darkness. That is uh, the best thing. Put the person totally into <laughs> darkness and then put flash on to mimic yeah. the background directions and such. And then it will look beautiful. Yeah. So black flags are your best friend on, on gray, boring days, yeah. I would say. And it's just keep them outside of frame and uh, and then just put up a coat or anything. Yeah, black. anything, anything dark. If you have a David black. Bishop by hand, you can just put him yep. standing yep. right next to it. Let me hold. stand. Yep. Yep. <laughs> totally black. I can like. Uh, Pascal asked me if the, if the trick is the same with mirrorless cameras. Yeah, I mean, the, the aperture and the shutter speeds, they work the same on, on all cameras. And it doesn't matter if you have a medium format Phase 1 or a, a mirrorless Canon R or, or a Nikon Z7 or, or so forth. Uh, what's this? And after uh, lighting your background and, and when you're lighting your subject, I always have problems to lighting when I try to use my Seconic light meter. Uh, in what way do you have problems? What is the problem? Is it like, is the person too bright already? So you don't have... Oh, any yeah, no, no, I think I, we already answered it. Yeah. So that's, uh, you follow, if you follow down. Yeah, so that's when you, when you, when you can use your TTL to, to also to help you out in saying that. Uh, Chris, is, what about ND filters to cut light? Oh, absolutely, you are, uh, it's very true. I mean, we use ND filters on flash. Cause yeah, I use ND filters like toilet paper all the time yeah. for, every, for everything. <laughs> I love ND filters, but maybe he... he uh, um, I mean, to cut light, so not to sell them, we actually end up with the flashes being too strong. Yeah. And we can't get them low enough. Yeah. Even the A1, we have occasions where it's not low, low enough. enough. Yeah. And that's when you use ND filters and yeah. I know you have all different levels of this uh, foil and, and you have big rolls of it. I have. So he really rolls. uses it like toilet paper. Yeah, I do. ND filters is, is really good, yeah. especially at this time of year in, in Sweden yeah, because and it's you, so dark. Yeah, and you put it in front of the flash, not in front of the camera. Exactly, in front of the flash. Yeah. In front of the camera, it's another story. Yeah. Uh, but in front of the flash to make the flash go, go even darker. Yeah. Um, there is actually one interesting thing with, with anti field anti filters that is just a, a subtopic of this. Yeah. Uh, I remember that I never understood the, the numbers of ND filters. Like you can buy, uh, like a, they are na named like 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 1.2, and what does those numbers mean? I never understood it. Is it like, what is it? Mm. So when I learned, I was like, oh, now I know. And if you do not know it, I will tell you. Oh, that's the next episode. No, <laughs> you tell them. <laughs> Always the cliffhanger. these cliffhangers. <laughs> okay, so these numbers of ND filters, like 0.3, that is actually three clicks. And how many stops is three clicks, Anders? One full yes. stop. So it's half the light. Exactly. So num 0.3 means three clicks. Click, click, click. One stop. 0.6 means six clicks. Click, 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 click. Two stops. That was seven. No. Sorry, <laughs> and so on. So the numbers are one third of a stop, yeah. and in other words, clicks. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, the B10. If we're using constant light uh, and fire the flash, does the constant go off? Yes, it does. Uh, so the constant light turns off, flash goes, and then it goes on again. So it does not uh, remain on yeah. uh, because it's, it takes too long time to to 
turn it, turn it off. Exactly. It's too slow. It's too slow. So it's always on. Really important to know because it's it can mix with your flash if you have your flash at a low setting. Yeah. Uh, and what about the app for Android users? Yeah, I, we, we, we've heard that and we were trying to uh, talk to the uh, uh, the developers as well uh, over at uh, Profoto and ask them uh, whether at, but we haven't received any answer. But as soon as I uh, uh, we hear anything, we will for sure let you guys know. Uh, which Profoto flash would be the best to start with? Ooh, that's an interesting question. It's like, how long is a string? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the answer is it's equally as long from the middle to one end to the other. That's it's twice yep, that's the, twice that length. That is so true. That's the length. But yeah. but it, it it all depends on what you are gonna do. If if your first gig is to uh, maybe shoot products uh, uh, on the very extremely high pressure, lot seven thousand pictures a day, and uh, yeah, that and, should and be a first gig. <laughs> yeah, and and then, and then you 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 might need like a, a Pro Ten or a D two. Uh, to really handle that volume, uh, but if you are um, going to shoot maybe in your home studio, uh, you want to start with your own studio, then maybe you know D1s, D2s, or or even B1s are, are a good starting kit. Uh, if you want something small and uh, like if you are not in a studio, just shooting yeah, your own, you, you go on, like, your on kids location, and such. yeah, exactly, or you want to uh, uh, take portraits in in different uh, at different companies or different locations, then maybe B10 is a, is a very good. Uh, starting point. If you want to have a camera, if you're a red carpet photographer or you're shooting party pictures and you want to have something like on, on, on camera solution, then the A1 is the best solution. So it is really difficult to, uh, we would need to know a little bit more what from do you, you Andrew, to shoot? On what do you want to shoot. No. Um, but any pro photo flash is always, of course, the best one <laughs> to start with. Yes, yeah. a. But uh, in order to buy the right product, because I mean, you can spend a fortune uh, on, on buying uh, 10 Pro 10s, um, but will you use them? Uh, that's the question. If you are David and you shoot what David is shooting, yeah, then, you know, yeah, then a, you a bunch of Pro 10s is actually a good investment because you make the money back. But I would say somewhere, if you are a, uh, if you're just starting with flash and you want to try out uh, and you want some flexible solutions, I, I, I would look at either the A1 or the B10. Those are two really yeah. um, good starting points. Potent uh, flashes with uh, a, a lot of uh, technical uh, solutions that would keep you flexible. Yeah, um, and I would say that the A1 is meant to be on camera. If you are, if you need the flash on a camera, like on an event or something. Then a red carpet. Red carpet, then the A1 is the only thing uh, because that's, you know, it's really easy to pop on the camera. Of course, you can have a Pro 10 on your camera if you have some interesting <laughs> solution for that. But uh, And if you are going to do something else, like have the flash off the camera, if you're going to do that for a main, you're, if that is going to be your main way of working, like taking portraits, yeah. then I would go for the, the, the B10. Because yeah. because with the B10, then you go straight into the whole environment of you know the e ecosystem of what Profoto has, the all, all the, the light all the light shapers, all yeah. the soft boxes, everything. Uh, so the A1, when you have a need for the flash on the camera, you yeah. can have a f um, uh, umbrella for the A1, but that's kind of it. I mean, it's great, but it stops there. But with the, if you start out with the B10, you can't have it on the camera as easy but you have the whole ecosystem of uh, products. So either one of yep. those two, depending on what you want to do with your flash. Exactly. But e either way, I mean, you will not go wrong. You can do a lot of fun things with, with both. But you know what, David? No. We are running out of time. Oops, Again. sorry. Again. Again. Uh, so just to repeat for you out there, if you're going to start using flash or you want to have a, a simple work process, start from the back in the image and work towards the camera. So and important. What's, in, what's all the way in the back? It is the background. Yeah. And then you make two decisions. One, how blurry you want the uh, image or the background. Not the image. That you said with the focus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how blurry uh, you want the background? Yeah. No. So how blurry you want the background if you want it really blurry or really sharp or in between. 
with the aperture and then you decide how bright, bright. it should be. Yes, with the shutter speed. With the shutter speed. Bright Up or and dark. dark. And use live view, look at the image and you see it right there. And when you have done that, you freeze it, you set it, don't touch the camera anymore. And then you start lighting. Yeah, uh, then it's not lighting. Uh, unless you are in a dark environment like a church or a uh, uh, cave or whatever, then you will most probably have a shutter speed that is too slow and you will get motion blur. And then you need to use ISO to raise everything up. Yeah. And then you get too much light. So then you bring up the shutter speed uh, to what you want and, and, and uh, compensate with ISO. So ISO and shutter speed are like yeah. really coupled together there to save your, your uh, exposure. Yeah. Exactly. We got one question from Marek. Which uh, of all the pro photo light shaping tools we would recommend for wedding portraits outdoors use? Quick setup is for me very important thanks well i mean the the fastest one is the umbrella, umbrella. and to use like it's also the easiest one to carry it's easy to carry it's also very easy to blow away very easy to blow away <laughs> uh, but so it's also very cheap so if it blows away you can buy another one <laughs> yeah. but that's not recommended <laughs> okay. uh, so so if you if you use umbrellas which are really i mean they are uh, easy to carry they're easy to set up they're fast and uh, using like a, a white umbrella is, is very safe because it spreads light all over and and uh, there's a big light source creates yeah. beautiful soft, soft light. light which normally people like with wedding photog uh, pictures yeah but then ideally if you have an assistant or a sandbag or something heavy that you can put on the light stand so it stands where that where it is then umbrella i would say is is, is a safe bet but if you have it's a little bit more time I would go with uh, one of David, I know your favorite light shapers, Ooh. which I yeah. see, I, I don't know if it's a favorite, but you use it a lot at least. Yeah, it is actually shoot. a favorite because yeah. I use it a lot. That makes me, makes it a favorite. Makes you happy. <laughs> makes me happy, exactly. <laughs> and my favorite is, yes. it's two soft boxes, one two by three and one one by three. Yeah. Two by three for creating all those soft things and the one by three to create kicker, kicker lights, kickers. Yeah. Um, that is my go-to kit. Yeah, I see that a lot. Uh, and, and I'm actually, I haven't used the two by three that much, uh, but I'm, I'm starting now to see the... Uh, yeah, the I mean, I mean the, the for me, really the benefits of the two by three is uh, the size isn't, you know, too bulky. It yeah. works like everywhere. Yeah. And the OCF two by three doesn't weigh anything. Yeah. It's so it's, so really it's easy almost like an uh, umbrella. So yeah. easy to carry. Takes a bit more time to put up, but just a not it's much. Not yeah. much. It's very so simple, the two yeah. by three for me is like the best middle thing, best way to, to start, best thing to start with, I would say. Actually, I wanted to squeeze in a comment from from uh, Michael Jansson up here. His name is a photographer from Sweden, a really great one. His name is Vega Photography. Uh, he says, he speaks, he, he writes in Swedish here, so I will translate. He says, create a depth with different Kelvin values on a model and the background and find something interest, interesting in a background. It's a tip from him and I agree that you can actually, this is quite advanced though, uh, you could actually work with different temperatures in the background and on your subject. Like you can have a warm background or a blue background and a neutral subject that will create totally different feelings on, uh, on your subject. Um, and yeah, so that is so true. So thank you for that tip, uh, and, uh, uh, Michael. Michael yeah. Cool, we have to uh, wrap up. We are way over time as always. Yes, uh, we but are so sorry. Thank you so much for uh, hanging in there and being very active with a lot of good questions. Love that. Uh, keep on posting questions if something pops up later. We, we, we are uh, checking, we are going back. Yep. Uh, and answering them. Answering them yep. if we can. If we most, can. Most, I mean, quite often I think we can answer. So if you have any more questions, just pop them in there. And uh, do follow Joel's uh, advice on a good starter kit is, is a Pro 10. I think that's great. <laughs> and a bat pack on your, on your back and then you have the Pro 10. That's yeah. a good, good no, it's Poor a, bat pack. Yeah, that's but a tough one. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, thank you, David. Thank you, Anders. Yes, and thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. And uh, cheers. see you next week, next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>